Hi, everyone. This is Sarah Jaggard from the Australian Drug Foundation. <coughs> Excuse me. And with me today I have um, Lee Bartlett from the Barwon Adolescent Task Force, who is going to be talking about how to create conversations with young people to reduce alcohol-related harm. Should we start? Sorry, setting a problem with the slides. Alrighty. Um, this education campaign is actually a partnership between the Department of Health, Vic Health and the Australian Drug Foundation. So um, the Victorian Government uh, funded Vic Health to conduct a communications and education campaign and then they contracted the Australian Drug Foundation out to carry out the education component. Um, so that consisted of um, a whole heap of different initiatives, um, including, including advertising, which you might have seen. Uh, a website, teendrinkinglaw.vic.gov.au, which has an online question and answer and discussion forum which you're welcome to access. We developed a series of podcasts, a smartphone app, um, a facilitator's toolkit and training session. <clears throat> We've been running a series of community forums, the last of which is this Wednesday night in Horsham, if anyone feels like attending, um, and also a series of webinars. So this is our final webinar. Um, and on that note, I'm going to pass you over to Lee Bartlett. Hi, how you doing? Um, my name's Lee. I do recognise a couple of names on the list. Um, apologies that the webcam's not up and running. It's not one on this computer, sadly. So I'm assuming everybody knows the drill about popping questions through. This is the first time I've run a webinar, so just a little bit of background on this. As I said, we've been running these around the state. We've had to modify it slightly for this sort of process, but in general what it is, the slideshow is about speaking to parents. And I understand uh, quite a few of you are working in the sector as well. So it's about, I suppose, just reframing it slightly so that you can have a look at the presentation and it shows what we're delivering to parents. It's been moved around a little bit based on a lot of the feedback we've had too. So it'll give you a sense of what we've been doing. Just before Lee starts, officially, um, if you've got questions, have a think about them um, and just pop them through as we go because we'll we've allocated half an hour at the end so we can, we can go through all your questions then. We'll try and answer them as they come up if they're relevant to the slides, but as you, you know, as you can imagine, there's a bit of a lapse here, so we'll see how we go with that. Okay. Um, we all right? Okay, so I suppose when starting this presentation, one of the things we, we have been starting with a bit of a trivia is to find out what our audience knows. That's probably a little bit more challenging in this environment. The three questions that keep coming up over and over is when we look at what alcohol means to Australia is what's our relationship with alcohol as a community but also as parents and you know, within our local communities how is alcohol used? What's our fascination with underage drinking? Uh, when we look at the secondary supply legislation what we've created is a, a set of rules and guidelines I suppose as to you know, how we're going to manage alcohol and underage parties. And the feedback we've had so far is, is right along the continuum from, okay, well, how do we manage alcohol so that people under 18 can drink, right through to the fact that we know that we shouldn't have young people drinking under 18. So really mixing up that harm minimisation with what we know as fact. So what is our fascination with drinking underage? Why do we need to create these rules in that space? And what are the messages we're getting out as parents, as community and as workers? And I suppose thirdly, which is what most of this presentation is about, what are some strategies with dealing with alcohol and its impact on community? When we talk about young people, we tend to separate them out from the rest of the community when we talk about alcohol. So this is very much about looking at them back in the context of whole of community. Oh, that's not going to... I've got to do it up there, sorry. Uh -huh. Okay, so we're going to start with Cheers Australia, obviously the most widely used drug in Australia. Alcohol-related crime and violence, illness, death, cost Victorian $4.3 billion a year. This is a huge amount. You know, I, I have to keep reflecting on what we could do if we were putting this back into education, health services, community support, because um, it is a lot of money and it's tying up a lot of resources. Most 16 and 17-year-olds we know who drink report doing so at a friend's house or a party, and we know that drinking large amounts of alcohol can cause death or serious brain injury. Okay, most young people will never try hard drugs. Um, I'm, I'm blessed to work in Geelong, so I, I have the Geelong advertisers sitting with me most days and often I'll watch sort of things on television, um, current affairs type shows. 
there seems to be such a big focus on, on your, your harder drugs and young people when we do know that alcohol and alcohol is still the biggest drug we're using. So most of these young people are really never going on to those harder drugs. That alcohol seems to be the big one. What we do know is that one in four young people will experience mental health or substance use disorder in any given year. That's probably really different to what it was, say, a generation or two ago. There's a lot of support within schools, within agencies, within families and communities now that means these young people are getting a whole heap of support or have access to. Even in our more regional centres, there's just a lot more understanding about the issues related to substance use disorders. So I think there's a bit of a change. That's certainly a shift we've seen in the last few years. Um, overall, our experience of alcohol consumption fell between 02 and 08. This is really positive. Of that fall, though, what we found was a smaller group of young people are drinking, but those who are drinking are drinking greater amounts. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. 25 Victorians aged 15 to 19 are admitted to hospital every week because of alcohol. Once again, this is a generation of young people who are becoming injured, are taking high-level risks related to alcohol. So alcohol-related harm is impacting on the generation. And we do know about the assaults, and obviously you know, our data of 30 young people is obviously higher than that. We assume that it's higher than that because a lot of young people certainly don't report incidences of assault. Okay, so if, you, if I get you to reflect a little bit on the communities that you live in, and I know you come from a very broad range of places, so while you're reflecting on that, just I want you to think about how many liquor outlets there are where you live. If you try and count up just quickly, you, you, most of you, the very few of you would have less than seven just in your surrounding neighbourhood areas. And then I want you to think about how many, say, fresh fruit and veg stores you have in the same area. We're talking about supermarkets, pubs, sports clubs, things like that. Alcohol is available at a very wide range of venues in our community. Um, and alcohol is used to celebrate everything from hatch to dispatch. You know, that's the Australian culture. The birth, deaths and marriages, alcohol is usually involved. We've seen a big shift in sporting facilities in the last few years through the Good Sports Program that the ADF has been involved with, which has been fantastic, which is showing more responsible use of alcohol. I think this is a real positive that we didn't have a generation ago, but we still need to attack and tackle the issue around sports gear and events being billboards for alcohol sponsorship. Um, we've noticed more recently that some, um, some companies are coming back on board and really attacking or using com um, community sport as a place to advertise their products. And this aligns with another, um, I suppose, a new issue around the young people that we're just starting to see is the sponsorship from our energy drinks as well. So, you know, your, your Red Bulls and mothers and things like that that are often around skate venues, um, high risk taking activities, motocross, things like that. So what we're seeing is a generation of young people are not only getting the messages about alcohol, they're also getting the messages about our energy drinks. They're often mixing the two. So we're starting to see a few new issues there. So when we're speaking to parents, it's really, really important that we talk about the, the, the impact that our young people are seeing around that. Um, and these images are everywhere on a daily basis. Okay, uh, this is a, a graph I like to use from the National Drug Household Survey from 2010. And what it shows is what we talked about just before, which is the recent non-use of drugs in our community. So for 14 years and over, you can see a very high percentage of young people didn't use a wide range of drugs from cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, hallucinogens, methamphetamines, inhalants, cannabis, and we get to alcohol and we see a really big gap there. So when we're talking to young people and we're talking to parents, we need to really make sure that parents understand that there is still alcohol a big one. And if we reflect back on how different drugs are used within our community, I mean, most children are very unlikely to see a lot of these drugs during their lifetime within the house or the local community, whereas alcohol is something they see. So we need to think about, this is not just something that impacts on young people, they're seeing this in the whole of community. And the lifetime non-use, very, very similar, big gap. Okay, 
when we talk about whether or not to introduce alcohol to young people, it's really important to think about adolescent development. This is a time when young people are, are moving between being a child and being an adult. And it's time when there's lots of biological, cognitive and psychosocial changes going on. Um, the biological, that come in terms of puberty, strength, physical size, early physical development, doesn't always match up with other areas of their development. Often you'll see the, you know, the girls who look 18, the big boys at footy, who could probably pass as over 18, but at the end of the day, a lot of them are still really young kids and that's how their bodies are working. Certainly, whilst they biologically might look like they're 18, cognitively they're still making decisions based on the level of experience a 14, 15 year old would have. Any of you who've watched junior sport in the last couple of years, you, know, you look at under 14 and it's boys against men, very big difference. So that cognitive, as they do get older and they get into it further into adolescence, their ability to make more rational and abstract or use more rational and abstract thinking. More importantly, their capacity to consider other people's points of view and the consequences of their action. So if they're choosing to drink or they're exposed to using alcohol at a point where they're really starting to play with the idea of what a consequence is, how's that going to impact on their decision making? Their capacity to address those ethical and moral issues. This is in, this is important to highlight, especially when we're talking about terms of consent, around sexual consent and um, the use of alcohol. It's often an area where young people can become unstuck. So it's a good conversation to have if you are a parent with your children or if you're working with parents, just to remind parents that these are things that young people are trying to navigate and adding alcohol to the fire is probably not very helpful. Obviously what we do know is a lot about brain development and a lot of the, the work that's come out of the ADF has been based on that. That front part of the brain, as a lot of you will know, is so responsible for your executive function, your ability to plan, prioritise, and you know, deal with the impulse and weighing up consequences. So it's really important that young people, while they're having the time to learn and develop that area of their cognitive development, that alcohol is not part of the game. How young people relate to the environment around them too is, is something that you know, they're, they're navigating whilst they're going through adolescence. Adding alcohol to that, you know, some adults come unstuck with that. So 14, 15 year olds, they need time to develop this and understand the, the social nuances around it. You know, they're becoming independent from their parents and that's a good thing. Often parents see that as a, a concern that their, their, parent, their kids are getting more pure and intimate relationships, moving away from parents. Well, I say to parents, they'll come back as soon as they want money or a lift somewhere. Um, their self-identity, who am I, what am I in relation to my friends, how am I different, how am I same, um, you know, the old Dr Seuss adage that there is only one you. you know, young people take some time to work that out and um, when they start going to parties, it's a time they're playing with that self-identity too and, and mixing with big groups. So if we start adding alcohol to that, there's often some confusion. Appear in intimate relationships, really important how they're relating to their same sex peers but also um, peers of the opposite sex, also within more intimate relationships. And this is something that needs to have some time to navigate before alcohol is involved. Um, body image, that all changes people grow up as we know. Um, they will start to have interest in jobs, goals, goals within their sport, goals within their community, things like that beginning to identify with behaviour modelled by parents and peers. Often parents will be the ones that will sort of step up and say, oh no, they, 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 they learn from their peers, they're not listening to me anymore. You know, the Archer's reports told us that parents still rate very, very highly in how young people identify and model behaviour. So the, the role of parents is really, really critical. That's why the ADF have chosen during the rollout of the secondary supply legislation to take some parent, ed parent education along for the ride. The reality is, in the 80s, we used to take young people out of schools, try and fix them and put them back. In the 90s, we started working with agencies a little bit more, um, you know, fantastic projects like School Focus Youth Service, other projects which came on board started to understand the, the idea of matching agencies and schools together to develop programs for young people who are vulnerable. What we realised not long after that was the absolute critical role that whole of family and whole of community played. So schools, some schools talk about parent engagement, some schools model really good work around that, but I think we're still all very, very hazy 
getting parents along for the ride so that they've got the same messages that the young people are getting in at school, but also an opportunity to skill parents up is really important. And agencies and schools are well placed to work with parents to develop that side of it. So what does this growth mean to parents? Uh, I suppose when we first started doing these presentations, people kept saying, well, what does this mean about alcohol? How does this relate to alcohol? I just want strategies. The reality is anything to do with adolescence and parenting is pretty similar, whether it's set, you're talking about sex, alcohol, parties, homework. It's about how to have the conversations and work out how to create that space within your family so that it works for when you need to have the conversation. What we do know is that big picture that young people start to develop during adolescence needs to come with boundary setting. That's part of their growing. That increase of independence and maturity does create opportunities for us as parents to renegotiate those boundaries. Um, an example of that would be, you know, often when I was working in schools, you'd have parents coming in saying, well, they keep trying to stretch the boundaries, but they keep breaking the rules. I think we need to work with parents or, or speak with parents about giving parents back a little bit of control in that space. Okay, if you're old enough, and I'll, an example of that, as a 14-year-old 14, a 14 who wants to start going out later on a Friday night, okay, well, if you're old enough to do that, what are we going to see in return? So it just doesn't go one way. If you're telling me you're old enough and you can have your sort of home time at 8 o'clock instead of 7 o'clock, what are we going to see around the house that tells us that you're mature enough to do that? so that they start to learn consequences within that controlled environment so that when they go out into the big world and there's going to be consequences, they're aware they're going to come. We've got a bit of a generation of, I know a lot of you would have heard the term bubble wrap, and that's that generation of young people who are not being allowed to take risks. So we don't want a generation of kids now to come through who are 15, 16, 17 taking their first risk with alcohol. This is something that can be practised at home and really encourage parents to say, well, okay, if you want your bedtime to go to 8 o'clock, what are you going to show me around the house that shows me that you have that level of maturity? That there is a consequence and there is a cost to having that level of responsibility. So this is negotiated out to a stage where they start to go to parties at 16, 17, and we say, OK, you're old enough to go to parties? What sort of things are we going to put in place that you can show me you're more mature? If they can start to show those um, traits around the house or around the community, then we can start adding those things in. But they, they, they've got to be shown. Uh, teaching parents not to dis, uh, mistake distance for disinterest. And most importantly, going back to our bubble wrap stuff, is that resisting giving unheralded advice. We don't need to fix everything. You know, we want the Lego buildings to fall. You know, we don't want them to hurt themselves, but they're going to need to come off training wheels eventually and fall off their bikes. They're going to make mistakes about things they wear, you know, make mistakes about not getting homework done. Sometimes kids need to learn consequence. And one of the things we can do is to start building in that unheralded advice all of the time and letting them say, you know what, that didn't quite work out. What could you do next time that's different? These are skills that need to be practised long before they start going to parties, long before they start drinking alcohol. And if you're working with families or you do have a family of young people who are starting to go to those alcohol fueled parties now, then it's a really big time to have conversations about that. So what do parents need to do during this time? One of the most important things is I actually learned um, when I was a young teacher in Giftland, I had an older teacher say to me, it's really important to not smile until Easter. And I didn't understand what that meant at first, and it was very much about being consistent with boundaries. It's always easy to loosen up. It's not so easy to toughen up. So being consistent with boundaries where possible parenting from the same team. Often we'll have one parent come to a parent ed session and they'll say, oh, yes, this works great, but when I get home, how do I get my partner outside? Parents often feel a need to answer a question straight away. Sometimes you can park things. Work, if you're working with parents or, or within your own family situation, just park it and see if you've had a chance to test it between yourselves. Look, 16-year-old comes up and says, I want to go to a party Friday night. You don't have to say yes straight away. And it's say, okay, well, I know that's important to you. We're going to have a chat about it and we'll make a time tomorrow to talk to you. So you've had a chance to get on the same page before you answer a question. We can do this with anything. We don't need to answer questions straight away. As long as we let the kids know what the time frame is, especially with boys, 
said, boys, really need to know a time frame. OK, we'll make a time tomorrow afternoon to sit down and talk about this as, as a family. And then go away, come up with some rules and some boundaries between the two of you. Kids know from two, three, two or three years of age which parent to go to when they want something. So this is something we want to encourage parents to do, is that making the time to say, you know what, we don't need to answer the question straight away. We know everybody's got busy houses, but let's stop parent from the same page. Setting clear boundaries and having clear expectations, really important. When you, when, uh, obviously a lot of you who do work in the sector, you know, especially when working with boys, knowing, you know, this is when we're going to have the discussion and this is what the discussion's going to be about. None of us like going to meetings where there's not an agenda. And this is the same for our kids. So setting clear boundaries around what we're going to talk about, but also clear boundaries around what behaviours are going to be expected and having clear expectations. Um, knowing that when you do go to a party that these are the expectations and that is all agreed on beforehand. Very difficult to, to retrofit expectations once a young person's gone along. So think of some of the things and get young people to think of issues that may occur at parties so that you've developed some language and, and some clarity around what both parents expect at the same time. One of the things we do know, and you know, having worked a lot with school nurses over the past, who I think is a fantastic program, the school nursing program, is the young people who tend to get themselves in a bit of strife in the community are the ones that have a lower level of protective factors. Now, we all know this. The more risk, the more likely they are to get in the strife. Um, there's a lot of things parents can do to strengthen the protection around their children, and that is connecting the family to schools connecting the family to community, making sure kids are connected. We live, in a, we live in a society where if a kid drops out of school, everyone jumps up and down, but if they drop out of a sporting environment, nobody tends to say anything. You know, football might not suit a child. Try soccer, try scouts, try the arts. There might be something else out there, but just trying to keep young people connected because that's where they learn that social contact, that social context to meeting. These are skills that we need young people to learn before they go to parties. It's also a way of knowing who your children can go to if they, don't, if they don't feel comfortable going to you for help, that they've developed other strong relationships with other adults in their lives through their sport, through their community and through their school. Often, I, I know in my community, I hear parents talk badly about school or teachers in front of young people and it, it tends to irk me a little bit because I think as parents, we need to, to lead the way in, in our children knowing that school's a, a good safety mechanism in their lives. So just checking in on language around how we talk about schools, really important. As child, children get older too, making sure that they know and can have access to other places they can go for help and support, local GPs, community centres, things like that. I've done a number of presentations in schools and a couple of times I've done presentations to students and then parent groups afterwards. And I'll say to the children, why, who would you go and speak to? And they're a little unsure. And I'll say to the parents, do you think your children would go to someone? Oh, yeah, they know they can. They know they can. Children need permission to speak to another adult. They need to know that their parents are actually OK with that. Often a child will, will not go and seek permission because they're scared they'll get in trouble for it or they don't think they're allowed to. So sometimes just having a conversation that as children get older, you know, if you don't feel comfortable coming to me, you can go and speak to another adult. You can check in and see who the adults are that they've got on their sort of therapeutic web of support, but it's really important to let children know. Okay, ensuring discipline has a learning outcome. I don't know about you guys, but I was grounded to a 40 that many times as a child that 40 was the first time I ever felt like I could really go out. Um, making sure that if we are disciplining children for, for breaches or, or mistakes with, that need required consequences, that it, that it has a logical sense to it. Um, often, um, when we're talking about communi communicating with young people, we need to think about it as a bit of a money in the bank situation. The younger we start it and create the space to have the conversations and type of conversations we have, it just means when the big ticket items like going out and driving and having our first sexual relationships and things like that, um, we've actually had some time framing conversations, so we've got some rules about it. When we first start going to meetings as workers, we're, we're a bit unsure as to how they work. That's a bit the same for our adolescents. They need to understand what the context is. You know, 
um, those conversations where we tend to start talking but they don't have an end to them, they can be really quite confronting for young people. So there's a few rules to it. Set a bit of an agenda when speaking to young people. Let them say, you know what, maybe we'll make a time on Saturday at 2 o'clock to go and have a hot chocolate and we'll talk about this. It's not going to go on forever and stick to that so that they know that you know there are boundaries around the conversation. It's not going to lead to something else. And make other times. You can have part of a conversation and if it looks like you need to continue it, say, all right, that's, that's all we're going to do for today and might make another time in a week or so to do this. Drive to and from activities are fantastic times to talk about it. And it might be just simple stuff like, oh, a mate of mine's children went to a party recently and there was alcohol. What would you do if that was your friends? Kids love to be the experts. So creating conversations about a third person is a really good way to check in on what skills your children have got to navigate a situation. Works really well with school groups too. So saying to year nines or year tens, we've got a group of year sevens coming through, what do you think they need to know? You know, they do really enjoy being the experts. Checking in when, with kids when things are going well, um, especially with girls, when a situation's going pear-shaped is not necessarily the best time to address issues. So waiting until things have calmed down. Yes, you do need to put consequences in place and discipline straight away, but maybe in two or three days' time when things are a bit calmer, it's about checking in and saying, you know, the other night when we talked about going to a party and everything got up in the air about it, what do you think we could have done differently? Give them a bit of power to change that situation. If they want that maturity, then they're going to have to start looking at ways that they can add to that conversation. Having regular health health checks with children. Um, what we found overwhelmingly in our parent ed sessions is when people have had children over 14 years old, they've been reluctant to leave the room and leave their children there. It's a really important place that young people know they can go for support is the local GP or counselling session. So if you're in there even just to have an immunisation or a checkup for a, a busted leg, leave the room. Let your kids know that it's a place that you feel safe, that they feel safe. And that the, the GPs can navigate the way around the confidentiality and working out if they're mature or minor. But letting your children know that you trust them to build a relationship with that person because you want to know that there's somewhere they can go. Getting parents on board with this can sometimes be a bit of a challenge, um, which means obviously as they get older, them having access to their own Medicare card as well. Talking not always best done at the table. There's sometimes when it is best done at the table, and that's you know, when you're talking about a more generic subject, you know, kids sitting around the table, what are two good things you did today, one not so good thing. Gets kids to start thinking about positive things in their day or bringing up if you've got a, a larger family or one or two kids sitting there saying, well, you know what, if this situation was to happen at your school, what would you do? And getting your different kids, they'll learn from each other's experiences on this. That helps them create the language that you need them to have when they've got to navigate those situations. Practice saying no. Um, I had a situation in a shopping centre once where a lady had come to one of our parent ed sessions, walked up to me and she said, I said no and it felt good. And my partner and my kids looked at me and said, who was that? You know, for some parents saying no is really hard and there's times when it is hard. Um, a, a great day a parent said at a session that I stole one night said was, you know, say yes whenever you can but when you say no, stick to it. It's really important. I just find no but thanks for asking works well in that situation. Okay, what is, when we talk about the building blocks of safety, um, we, we want our children to know how to feel safe when they're out. So we need to start practicing that stuff at home. One of the things we need to talk about with, with alcohol, and we, I remember a session up in Shepparton the other day, one of the, it was actually a, a youth um, liaison policeman said, his daughter wanted to have a party and she was 16. And they said, fine, but you won't be having alcohol there. And she said, well, then it's not a party. Don't worry, I won't have one. And everyone went, oh, yeah, no, that's what this secondary supply is about. Well, the reality is, at the end of the day, where have they learnt that? And that that's the question we need to, to ask. Where, where are they learning that it's got to have alcohol to be a party? Possibly learning that from the broader environment. So we need to think about how we do celebrate. How many people have asked, what does alcohol mean in our family? 
you know, what does it mean to our kids? You know, we were travelling up in far north Queensland. One of my kids saw a big VB sign. He said, I'm going to drink that when I'm a big man. I was quite horrified. I didn't really understand where he got that from. It was very confusing for me and confronting for me. Um, and it is. It's about the images they're seeing out in the community all the time. Um, sorry, we just had a bit of an interruption in the room. Um, promoting the importance of looking after your mate. This is something that starts at school sport, it starts at home with your siblings, and it's something that can be reinforced over and over. So if your kids pick someone up or check in on someone in the playground, if they're checking in at school, if we can continue to reinforce that looking after your mates, hopefully what we're doing is instilling that sense of how important it is so when they start going to parties, that that becomes pretty standard for them. That You know what, one of my mates is wandering off with somebody now and I'm not too sure who that is. I might go and check in on them. I, I did a, a session at a school one, one day and somebody said, um, oh, Miss Everybody Knows It's Bros Before Hoes. And I, I, I wasn't too sure what that meant at the time. And it was, you look after your mates. More importantly, you look after the girls. This is something we need to change. You know, I'm sure it doesn't happen at all schools, but it is a comment that is out there. So it's just about, you know, how do you look after your mates? But also really important, the importance of what you do as a bystander. If one of your mates did this, what would you do? And checking in on what that means to your children. That's important. Selling the importance of having a plan. Um... Often when we were growing up, but also, and I'm in my mid-40s, often when we were growing up or we send young people to parties, the, the standard line is, okay, well, don't drink, don't get in a car with a drink driver, don't do this, don't do this. The kids are hearing blah, 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 blah. One of the things when we talk about having a plan is asking young people to think about what they're going to do, think about what their going, actions are going to be ahead of the night. And that can be as simple as, and under 12 getting ready for football. You've got football tomorrow, what's your plan? I don't know, not a good plan, okay? Well, I need to get my mouth guard, I need to make sure my football socks are ready. I'm just trying to think of all the things we went through Saturday morning now. I need to make sure I've got my drink bottle, my ventilation, all of these things. As opposed to us sitting there saying, go and get your mouth guard, go and get your drink bottle, go and get your footy gear. They need to learn to internalise that process of thinking so that when they start going to parties at 16, 17, What's your plan? Well, we're meeting at so-and-so's house. We're going to catch a taxi cab from there. Um, we're not going to drink. We're going to take this to eat. And what's our plan for getting home? We want to know that our children have really strong, solid plans when they leave our houses rather than just the time they have to be home. And that includes something beyond a mobile phone as a, as a, as a safety net. Um, I don't know about you guys, but my experiences of young people in mobile phones is no credit, don't know where it is, or the battery's flat. Uh, we have a generation of people who don't know phone numbers because they're all on speed dial, making sure they've got a list of four or five numbers on a piece of paper in their wallet as well, so that if they do lose their phone or it's flat, that they've still got access to some phone numbers. Another point that's really important is let them know that no matter how late it is, you will do whatever you can to answer the phone. This is really critical. So many young people who come in, act, into the services or into schools after something's gone pear-shaped and their mums or dads or carers have just said, why didn't you ring? I didn't know I could or I thought I would get in trouble. We had one parent one night who said that she's got to deal with her kids that no matter how late it is, they can call her, she'll go and get them, no questions asked, but the next day they'll have to sit down and talk about it. But that night, there's no consequence. It's just making sure they're home safe. Really, really hard. Sorry, I've had a question come up here. How do you emphasise a limit of one to two drinks is sufficient to celebrate? Um, it, it's a really good question. It probably comes back to that how we socialise young people with alcohol. And if we're talking, and Monique, I'm not sure if you're talking about under 18 or not, but the reality is we're saying that young people really shouldn't be drinking until they're 18. That's, that's the reality of it. My sense of this, and I don't work for the ADF, I'm a, I work for the Bowen Adolescent Task Force, is that if you give a child one or two drinks or tell them it's okay to have one or two drinks, you're probably giving them a licence to have three or four. Um, it's, a, it's about um, finding a way. In, in your family, that comes down to your decision. 
But at the moment, what we're saying is, you know, no alcohol. If you choose to have one or two drinks, chances are that there's probably going to be more alcohol at a party anyway. I don't know if that's answered your... How do you get kids to stick to a plan they make, though, after they leave? Well, that's probably about practising those plans before they go to parties so that they've had some experience with what happens if you don't stick to a plan. So occasionally we've got a plan, we've got to get this done, we don't get it done, it's got a consequence, and the consequence may mean something as simple as your room wasn't clean so you didn't get to do something. They need to know that there's a consequence. Um, you used all the credit on your phone, and I didn't top it up till the end of the month because that was our plan. So they need to understand that all plans have consequences. If they practice that long before they start going to parties, then hopefully what we'll do is, is instill with them that this is our plan and if I, if I don't stick to it, then there'll be consequences at the end of it. In saying that, that the reason they're adolescents is because they make mistakes. That's why we don't let them drink, drive or vote. So it's probably really important to, to know that, okay, occasionally there's going to be mistakes or a plan's not going to be stuck to for a certain reason. So always have a time to revisit plans. And, you know, if they don't stick to a plan, well, there's a consequence in that for next time. I hope that's answered that. Um, so continue to sell that idea of having a plan. Uh, finding out where your children get information from. It's actually okay for them to get information with their friend, from their friends, but let them know that it's okay to test that information with you and let them know that it's okay that there's other places they can go to to get that information. We know schools now have fantastic resources. Libraries have great resources. Plenty of good stuff online, and I know Sarah's got a few websites at the end of this that have got some really good information. Have them sitting up around the house. Um, I, I always write in, the, remind them that you love them, and then a guy at a presentation in Vermont the other night said, but you can't put but on the end of it. And he, he kind of got me on that one, and he's right. And I reckon I do it with my kids too. We'll say things like, I love you, but, or I love you, however. We're trying to say that the I love you thing is completely unconditional, so we can't put conditions on it. So you need to leave the rest of the howevers and the buts for a completely other sentence. That no matter what, we love you. Really important to say to our kids. So keeping the rest of the consequence for another occasion. We're going back to that question about the plan too. Some kids will stick to plans really well. Um, other kids will get a bit confused with it and just take a little bit more time. So it might be about just putting a little bit more boundaries around that until they get the hang of the plan. Somebody's written here, peer group pressure is a strong factor too. Peer group pressure is huge. It's part of adolescence. It's part of learning what boundaries is, learning how I'm different and learning how I'm me. That's about the, the conversations we, take, we have with our kids. Uh, and look, I did this yesterday about an eight-year-old who doesn't want to wear a helmet to play footy because no one else in his team wears one. You know, at the end of the day, in our house, it is a rule that you wear a helmet when you play under 10 footy. And, you know, other kids are going to say, you have a choice, you don't have to play football. So it's about saying to people that if you choose to go with peer group pressure, then there'll be consequences if that's different to the plan that we've made ourselves. So letting them know that, yeah, you get the fact that there are different kids out there who want to do different things, but you're you and we're our family and this is how it's going to work right now. Other than that, if they, if they choose to keep going with that peer pressure, then that's a big flag that they're not, they're not going to make those decisions. Some kids will make mistakes with it one or two, once or twice, but making sure that overall we need to make sure that they know that they need to stick to their plan. Okay, building safety takes time. Investing in a language of safety. You know, for young kids it can be, what does it feel like when I feel unsafe? How does my body feel? What do I feel? Um, we have a lot of kids, we know a lot more now about kids on the autism spectrum, or Asperger's spectrum, and we need to think about how we explain to these kids what a language of safety is. They don't often pick up the social language of other people. So really practising that from a young age of, you know, and this is where I don't like doing things online because I can't show you what I'm doing. I'm quite a visual person usually. Is you know, If I feel uncomfortable, what does that feel like? You know, If I don't feel safe, what does that feel like? What language am I going to use in that? You know, if I, do I, I need to stick with my mates. Really, really important to stay with your group. Walk in, um, I, I live in a regional area, walk where there's lights. You know, know, make sure somebody knows where you are. It's 
speaking to the kids constantly so this is reminded long before they start using alcohol. Modelling good behaviour, um, you know, we know a large percentage of kids see their parents drink on a daily basis. We look at some of the stuff that's on television, in video games, things like that now. There's a lot of alcohol out there on television shows, you know, winners and losers, packed to the rafters. The alcohol is quite a few scenes in these television shows. And as adolescents are growing up, this is a type of soap drama that they're watching at home. How do we model our behaviour? Somebody asked us before about, you know, the one or two drinks is sufficient to celebrate. Why do we have to use alcohol to celebrate when we're underage? You know, that's the question. What, why do we need to do that because we're underage? You know, that's just something you make as a decision when you're an adult. And how we model that behaviour is every time we celebrate, do we have to have a drink of alcohol? When we serve alcohol at home, do we serve it with water? Do we serve it with food? Um, do we have nights at the dinner table where we, we have water or we have something, milk, something different? You know, looking at how we celebrate it. Do we model... If you've got kids who are 15, 16, 17 in the house, do we model what a standard drink is? With most, most of us now being exposed to these big wine glass fish bowl things that wine comes in now, I think a lot of us are struggling with what a standard drink is. Um, how do we start modelling that before our children start going out drinking? This is just something to think about. Using media as examples to enforce the message of safety. If you see something on television, okay, well, do you think that's something that your friend would do or what would you do in that situation? But, you know, we, our kids are exposed to so much more media than what they, we were a generation ago. Looking at this and saying to our kids, you know what, you guys get to see a lot of this stuff. What do you think it means to your generation to see all these alcohol images? What do you think it means to your generation to see all of the advertising that's going on? Um, and continue, yeah, practising those safety plans from a young age. It works really good in a classroom too, the um, safety plans. Is the, you know, today we've got to get through this, this and this. What's your plan? And get young people to start saying, well, OK, well, maybe if we do this this way, we can get that done. Start to give them that sense of ownership. So I'm just reading the questions. If I, I'm a very slow reader. I'm more of a talker. Um, Year seven students. Um, that's from Kate. That's good. Um, I've got a, a couple of mates who teach year sevens and a couple of schools I've worked with in the past who are using What's Your Plan a lot with year sevens and getting them to think and produce work in sort of for the next year's level. And they, they're saying the same thing that's working really well. Looking at advertising and to turn on their radar. Yeah, really important point, um, especially with year sevens, is, is get them to look at images they're seeing and saying, and getting them to negotiate and create language around it. You know what, this is not something I want in my life, this is something I understand that's there. And I'm seeing images here that aren't for me. We, we talk about putting filters on, on computers these days, we need to put filters on kids. So looking at advertising, turning their radar on is a really good line. Um, getting them to say, you know what, I'm not old enough to be dealing with this stuff, or this is for when I'm older, or I need to negotiate this with an adult. So there's plenty of lines you can work with young people around. Do I need an elder, adult to help me negotiate this? And getting them to pick and choose what they think they need an adult to help them negotiate. So the secondary supply legislation, and we haven't talked much about it. Um, no, I should probably explain yeah. that for, because um, I know that there's a lot of um, interstaters that have logged in, and you might not know um, that back in November last year, the Victorian Government actually brought in secondary supply legislation, so that was on the 1st of November. Um, and what that now means is that it's illegal for um, anyone to provide alcohol to a minor in a private premise unless they have the permission of the person's parent or guardian. And there's quite a substantial fine in place um, if, if that should occur. Isn't now, isn't now called teen drinking? Or I suppose that, yeah, the, the secondary supply legislation, did you want to speak more about it, Sarah? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. we just, the, the, advertise, the, the communications and education campaign um, was, was called the teen drinking law. Um, we refer to it as secondary supply, but you can call it teen drinking law, um, whatever you want, really. I don't think secondary supply sort of, you know, makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. Um, Is it any? The, the legislation that came in recently um, is Victorian legislation and that's what um, we've been doing this education and communications campaign around. 
but there is legislation in um, New South Wales, Victoria, and, uh, sorry, New South Wales, Tasmania, and Queensland, and they're all slightly different models. Um, someone's just asked what the fine is. Um, it's an on-the-spot fine of 733, um, and the large fine is over $7,000. Somebody's asked if the legislation applies to other miners providing alcohol, and that's actually a really good question. We've been asked that a couple of times. If a young person supplies alcohol to another young person, then yes, they can be done with secondary supplies. There hasn't, no, there hasn't been a, a test case in Victoria, um, and this is, a, this is where I think it gets a bit tricky and a bit confusing for people, um, because it actually hasn't played out in the court of law. Um, so there's a lot of things that we, we don't actually know how it's going to work until that happens. Somebody just asked a question about whether it applies to BYL, and it's probably the most asked question we've had so much. Um, it, it, it doesn't apply to BYO, and what we need to do is think about just levels of sensibility with a party. If someone's choosing to have a party at home and young people turn up with BYO, which is often the biggest issue at parties, then as adults we've got to make decisions about do we ask them, tell them they're not allowed to bring it in, you know, do we take it away while they're in the house and then give it back to them at the end of the night, um, or do we ring their parents? I, I spoke to someone the other day who said they had two kids turn up with their own alcohol and they chose to ring the parents of these two young people. So no, the secondary supply does not cover BYO drinks. If young people do choose to bring their own drinks or turn up to your property already drunk, you probably still have a duty of care as far as we know, to make sure they're safe. But at the end of the day, it's just about that using that duty of care and, some com and a common sense approach. And I think that it's really important to emphasise the duty of care to people because if you have a minor on your property and they are harmed because they were um, intoxicated, then that, you know, the, the person hosting the party could be held liable. Yep, so I'm hoping that clears that up. Uh, one of the... It, it does bring up that point of you know, how does secondary supply legislation change our approach when we're having parties. If you do choose or someone chooses to have a, a 16th, 17th, 18th party, which are the ones that are most likely to see the alcohol, personally I think 18th is probably tougher than even 16th because you've got a mix of underage and overage. It's about being really clear right from the beginning about what your rules are going to be. As parents, if you're going to send your children to a party, what the secondary supply legislation does enable you to do is it gives you a context to ring the person who's having the party and have a real conversation with them to say, do you know about this legislation? How are you going to impose it at your party? So it actually gives parents a context to ring. Often parents feel a bit funny about ringing. Um, Cheryl, there have been fines issued um, in all the other states. But because they're infringement notices, um, they, haven't, they haven't actually been recorded. So we know that fines have been issued, but we don't actually know how many. Um, but yeah, you're right, in New South Wales, the secondary supply legislation has been in place for, I think, around 20 years. Yep. I think we know that there's been cases where in Tasmania someone's been... Yeah, the, it, yeah, yeah people have been... Yep. Fine in Queensland. Yep. It's, it's good to let kids know about the secondary supply legislation. It's also good to explain to them why they shouldn't be drinking under 18. We often hear that you know, in European countries people socialise their kids with alcohol all the time. The reality is they don't have the binge drinking culture we have in Australia and we need to understand what the context is that we're supplying people with alcohol with. The fact that we're actually having a discussion about how do we provide alcohol to people under 18 is a bit confusing for me. Um, but it's about how you choose to have conversation and each family still will certainly choose to, to deal with it differently and we respect that but this legislation means that the reality is if you're going to have alcohol to party then kids need to fill out a note to give them permission to, or consent to drink alcohol and it can be verbal or written and it has to be signed by parents or, well, it, it, or yeah, it, could, it, can, it can be verbal or written but the person that is getting the consent has to be absolutely confident that they have it, because if something happens, then the onus is on them to prove it. Is there any updates in South Australia? Um, I'm not sure about South Australia. I'm pretty sure that it's on the agenda of both WA and South Australia yet, but it's, I, I, I don't know how far it's gone. And I'm sure over time the Australian Drug Foundation will put more information out yep. if it's coming through. All right, so... <laughs> I've talked a little bit about finding out who who young people go to for alcohol and who they go to for information, whether it be about secondary supply, alcohol or any information. So 
if, if I ask you to think now, whether you're a worker, a parent, think about a child that you do know, someone you're working with or your own children, look at your hand, and, and some of you may have done the old PB's training, but look at your hand and think of five different people that that child would go to for information if they couldn't go to you. And at some stage, check in with that young person and see if it's the same five. Um, in a few of our sessions, we've had children and their parents there, and it has been really different. Is party staff still being provided support by VicPol? Um, yep, party staff is still running. Um, I think VicPol have got some information on their website about it. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's, it's really different in different regions too, how it's been rolled out, the party safe. So some local governments are putting some extra stuff on top of it as well. So it's just worth checking in and finding out how that works in your region, which I'm assuming is Gippsland. Okay. So knowing where kids are is important. Um, often if you speak to school nurses, they're the first ones to say the young people who get in trouble are the ones whose parents don't know where they are. The, the algorithm that is who's sleeping over at whose house, I'm always fascinated by year nine girls who can't grasp the concept of algebra but can grasp the most complex uh, way of saying who slept over at whose house. So knowing what's at the sports clubs, knowing what's at youth groups, community groups, friends, places, drop-in centres, parties, informal gathering, sleepover. As one parent said at one session, and, and I would like to make a T-shirt out of it, be that parent. Be that parent who rings. Be that parent who rings other parents to find out about it. Be that parent who says no. Be that parent who turns up and has a look. I, I love the one of the parent who, when her children go to parties, she insists on taking a plate. She's been doing it since her child was three. Her child's now 17. She still insists on taking a plate, and she still takes it all the way into the kitchen. Her child knows that if she's not allowed to take a plate, then she's not going to the party, so she's learned to deal with it. I've also had some other good tips from parents, things along the lines of, you know, turning up five or ten minutes late, just getting a sense of what's going on at a party, um, but still really gobsmacked at the number of parents who won't ring up. Um, you know, 14th birthday party down the coast at somebody's house and people going, oh, they'll be right, they all go to school together. They all know each other through school. You know, be that parent, be that parent who rings. Really important. Youth groups, community groups, all of those places. You know, things like good sports have enabled those places to become really safe for young people. But you want to know who's in charge, what their roles are, what time those events are finishing, and certainly at, at football clubs and cricket clubs, you know, what the interaction and how the interaction is managed between the senior players and the junior players. Um, we know good sports is rolling out, but we also know for a lot of you who are, who are um, logging in from regional areas that a lot of juniors do tend to play up in senior environments. What does that mean? What are they getting access to or what are they privy to? that they wouldn't be if they are in an underage environment. And asking the clubs how they're going to manage that interaction. Okay, when to get worried. Uh, is this part of the parenting culture? Try to be your teen... Somebody's just written about trying to be your teen's friend or um, parenting, I think, is the, the common word for it. I think there's a bit of a misconception with a lot of parents that if they say no, their kids will bail and won't come back. Um, trying to get, and it is a really tough one, but it needs to be started right from the beginning that young people understand that there are boundaries for a reason and the most important reason is that you love them. Um, and, and as long as we're consistent with those boundaries, look, there's always going to be kids who buck the system and there's always going to be kids with you know, flags that are going to struggle with that stuff, but somebody's just written and, and they're right. You know, at the end of the day, they've got friends, they need parents, and I think that's a really good way of writing it. But at the end of the day, your role is as a parent. You didn't sign on to be a friend, you signed on to be a parent. So letting your kids know and being really strong with that language. I think it's a bit blurry for kids today. There's a lot of grey out there. I know you can often read a kid's school report and not exactly know which of your children they're talking about. I think sometimes kids need a bit of black and white around. And that's, the longer you practice that, the easier it gets. Certainly not going to be easy the first time. Um, when do parents get worried? When their children are consistently withdrawing from family? Yeah, that's a good line. Put the verb back into parent. <laughs> I like that one. I might use that one. Uh, there's a noticeable change in grades and performance at school. 
this is a time, you know, it, often kids will go ebb and flow, but if you can see it's a consistent change in grade, go and speak to the school. They know your kids, they're stakeholders in your children's lives. Let them be part of the conversation. Your child begins to lose interest in sport or community activities. If they're not interested in doing one thing, let your kids know that it's okay, but we need to find something else. What are we going to replace it with? Because we actually have it as a value in our house that you need to be connected to something. I'd, I'd love it when school reports get to a point where you're actually reporting on how kids are connecting to school um, community as well, and that's actually valued within a school environment as well. Uh, your child begins to lose interest in sport and community activities. We've talked about that. Your child loses touch with, French, with their friendship group. They're not interested in hanging out with mates. This is, you know, for some girls this can happen between recess and lunch. We know that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's when they're consistently not choosing to hang out with their mates. We need to start to think, hang on, something's wrong. Most importantly, when working with parents, or if you are a parent, if something doesn't feel right, we need to value that. Often there will be um, parents, people will try and make them feel better and go, oh, don't worry about it, I'm sure everything's fine. Parents know this stuff. If something doesn't feel right, often it's not. I think there's a bit of fear around there that if we say something to our kids, they'll, they'll run the other way, but often they're quite um, relieved that somebody's noticed. So for, for people who've got kids in school, keeping speaking to the school and letting the school know how you feel so that you can have a bit of a coordinated approach to what's going on. Speak to sports coaches or community leaders who might be involved in your children's sport or community. Local GPs and counsellors can often be a really good first, first port of call when we're not too sure. But most of all, speaking up and letting children know that you've got concerns, reinforcing that you love them and um, that you want to help. All right, so what's your plan? We talked about it really briefly. Um, practicing it. Practicing it with small things around the house. All right, we go, you want to go out this weekend. Really happy for you to go out Saturday night, but I want your room cleaned. Really simple plan. And if the room's not clean, it's not okay, you can do it on Sunday. It's just no. No, the rule was I told you Thursday that it had to be cleaned by Saturday. If we can start to be consistent with those sort of smaller plans around the house, then they're going to know that there's going to be consequences. Somebody mentioned before when plans get broken. They get broken because we often allow them to get broken. Um, testing plans, putting a couple of things in there, seeing how they go. Rewarding plans when they go well. Catching kids being good is the best thing we can do to reinforce good behaviour. We're really good at catching them doing the wrong thing. We've got to really catch them doing the right thing. Like I was really proud of you the other day when you helped your brother do so and so. Rewarding that, looking after your mate's behaviour. Modelling the behaviour at home. You know what? I won't have a drink tonight. I've got to go out and do something else later. Talking it through and having the conversation out loud so our kids learn what that good behaviour is. They're watching us from a very young age. Creating opportunities to revisit plans as individuals but also as families. Uh, Parenting 101, this is things I've stolen from parents along the way. No one communicate your expectations about alcohol with your children. In our house, this is our expectation about this. Saying yes whenever you can, but when you say no, stick to it. Be that parent. Be that parent that rings the party. Be that parent that says no. Be that parent that's going to help out. Remind them you are coming along for the journey and that you care. You know what? We're not always going to be able to solve everything for kids. But we can tell them that we're prepared to go along the journey. You know, they're going to, occasionally some kids have big hiccups. We can't fix them overnight, but let them know that you're prepared to go on that journey with them and find out what we can do to fix that up. Um, I was asked, oh, just finishing off with this, I was once asked to write a, a brochure about what adolescence was. <laughs> it was really hard. So um, it's like trying to nail jelly to a tree, and it does take more than one set of hands to deal with the mess and I suppose for me this is just a reminder that you know, we often hear that technology is there for the kids and they're organising parties and doing all this and they can quickly get messages to each other about where parties are and I'm thinking to myself, which would mean in most communities the parents could do the same thing if they had a mobile phone or access to Facebook, that you know, parents can do the same thing, they can speak to each other, they can stay in contact and we can create a, a, an environment where parents will speak up and say, you know what, is your child going to this thing on Saturday night? What's your opinion about this? 
start to develop a community shared response to how we feel about young people and alcohol and keeping our young people safe. Awesome. Thanks for that, Lee. Another fantastic presentation. Um, we've just got a few websites up here that might be handy for you to visit, um, teendrinkinglaw.vic.gov.au, which I mentioned before, um, and also the ADF website. And there's also quite a few websites which might be good for, um, for your kids, which you might want to visit with them. Um, we've allocated time for questions, so if anyone's got anything else that they'd like us to answer, please feel free to whip them through. Or anything else that they want us to share with other people, there's all you know, some really good ideas out there. Are these slides on the website? Um, these slides are not on the website for parents, but I'm sure that we can distribute them. And look, um, yep, 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 so we can get a PDF out to you. Um, while I think of it also, um, it would be really great if we could, I could get you all to do an evaluation for us. Um, so I'll be sending it through to you this afternoon. Keep an eye out. Yeah, thanks Ace, for listening. It's the first time I've done a webinar. It is, it is quite weird not being able to get feedback from an audience and thanks for your questions. It does prompt me and it makes me think somebody's listening. So thanks Ace, for listening. <laughs>
capacity, things like that. So it might be about teachers putting one or two things up or local community leaders getting on those sites and really having a bit of a, a buy-in and getting them to start their own conversations. A lot of these people have the answers to these questions and they've got some really good strategies. So I think the social networks already exist. It's about how we can feed this information into them. Um, someone's asking who is the group supporting the youth in Portland and Hamilton? Uh, through School Focus Youth Services, I know they ran a program. Um, I don't know who the exact local worker is, but if you rang Brophy Services and spoke to Julie, who's the, the worker down there for School Focus Youth Services, you may be able to get some more information. Okay, Monique wants to know, how do we ensure confidentiality when speaking to other parents? Well, it depends on what, I suppose it's, it's, it depends on what we're speaking about. Um, we need to, like in any situation, what we, what, we just need to have that conversation up front. I'm going to speak to you about something, you know, can you ensure that I'm going to be, this will be confidential. It'd be no different to how when we're working with young people. We've just got to make sure we have the conversation up front about confidentiality and, and the standing thing is unless you're at risk of harm or you're at risk of harming somebody else, then yes, we will make this confidential. The, um, and, and sorry, because I don't know what context you're asking the question in, it's also about, you know, often young people will go to somebody who's not skilled up to test it on. It's that young, with that person saying, you know what, I'm not the best person for you to speak to about this. So if you do say something, I'm happy to go with you to somebody else. So if they're going to speak to other parents, then that's a conversation that you've got to skill your children up. You know, if you speak to somebody else, they may have to get somebody else in to help with the information. Find some parents go straight back to their kids. Monique's just said that she finds some parents find some parents go straight back to their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look. Once again, I'm not too sure of the context of the question. Um, it's just about putting that confidentiality straight back. You know, have the conversation up front so that you know you're going into it with the same rules. Once again, I think when you're speaking to parents, it's very much the same as speaking to other children. Is having really clear expectations with the conversation up front. No worries. Any more questions? Alrighty, um, we might leave it there. If anyone's got any questions that they, for whatever reason, did want to ask today, you can email it through to me and I can forward it on to Lee. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for, for taking part today. Thank you. Great. Thank you.